if the use of your credit card is part of a properly managed strategy, recognizing that once you're back at work, once the furlough is over, that you'll be able to pay it down in a reasonable way, then yes, it is a reasonable strategy. Just remember, Frederica, mm. credit card interest rates are in the 20s. They are wow. absolutely usury by most standards. My goodness. All right, Dr. Daria Long. Patricia in New York is asking, there is a lot of talk about social distancing, but what do you do when you're on an overcrowded subway or bus? Yeah, and Patricia's in New York, so she may be one of those groups of people who can't avoid the subway or the crowded bus because they're essential and they have to get to work. So for those people, there are some guidelines we can tell them. So for one, of course, maintain social distancing as much as you can. If you can, stay six feet away from other people on the bus or the subway, do so. Other than that, absolutely, I would want somebody to be wearing a mask the entire time they are on there, even a cloth mask, be wearing a mask. And then you can do two other things. You can wear an outer layer that you carefully remove when you get out of the subway or bus or wear gloves but key point we are seeing a lot of people wear gloves and I do want to say you have to remove them carefully or you eliminate the effect so mm -hmm. you're going to pinch the outer glove with one hand and then take your clean finger to remove the other so that you're not touching the outside and of mm -hmm. course wash your hands afterwards that makes sense all right Dr. Gail Salta David from Long Island asks how do I talk to my 65 year old father about limiting his visits to the store without sounding like I'm scolding him David, the relationships that are happening between adult children and their parents and, and kids who suddenly arrive back home, there's such pressure going on and so much anxiety going on that things are being heard in critical ways or people are saying things in irritable ways, which is all very understandable. But if you realize that your parent is used to being the parent mm -hmm. and you simply say, hey, I love you and I'm really just worried about you. So I'm, I'm asking you not to do this because I understand it puts you at greater risk. And for me, I, I, my worry, my anxiety, I would really feel better if you wouldn't do it, which is different than saying, hey, I know better and I told you so. But people are really struggling with relationships right now and I just offer, ha try to have empathy and stand in the other person's shoes and realize that everybody's a little more anxious at least and a little right. more irritable. And, and take a step back uh, when you when you make your comments. All right, may have to modify your approach. All right, Richard Josh from Pennsylvania asks, can an employer threaten your job if you don't have a babysitter or caregiver for your child that's related to the coronavirus? This is a really complicated one because mm -hmm. it will differ depending in jurisdictions around the country. Essentially, everybody is an employee or many in most states you're an employee at will which means you can be fired pretty much at a whim however however the family's first coronavirus act does have various provisions that could and can help you along with the family medical leave act essentially you can take for example paid leave the new act gives uh, two weeks of paid leave and then you can go on to other leave, paid sick leave, which would give, for example, more time, although not necessarily at full pay. So the, the, the short answer is essentially you don't have a protection as, a, as an employee at will. The longer answer is the nuances, there are plenty of ways around it. You should not be fired. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody stand by. We've got more uh, questions and, of course, we've got answers in just a moment. But first, uh, take a look at this. A sign of the times at George Bush Intercontinental Airport in Houston. Planes parked on the runway because of all the flight cancellations. And here's a rare sight involving our food supply. Dutch farmers dealing with an overwhelming amount of potatoes because demand is down due to restaurant closures. Welcome back. We're separating fact from fear and answering your coronavirus questions. Uh, Dr. Long, um, this question is from Edward in Florida. Mosquito season is about to start. Should we be concerned about mosquitoes transmitting COVID-19? Okay, Edward, you're in Florida, so that is kind of mosquito central. I'm in Georgia, I know it too. There is evidence, we know mosquitoes can carry other viruses, but there's not evidence right now that they can actually transmit coronavirus from one person to another. Mm. 
Phew. All right, Dr. Saltz, yeah. here's a question for you. You know, how do you avoid being lonely when you are single and forced to social distance? Um, this is a, we already had a public health epidemic occurring of loneliness in this country to begin with before this even happened. Um, and actually, as many as 25% of Americans live alone, uh, in addition to the fact that now our coping skills are impeded by the fact that we have social distancing. I am telling people how important it is to find other means of talking with people. That might be FaceTime, it might be Skype, it might be Zoom, it might be just on the telephone. Um, and what I'm telling people is the importance of using your words to convey more emotion than you probably normally do. And I say that because we can't touch each other, right? Mm -hmm. We can't hug each other. We can't do those things that really are important in dealing with feelings of loneliness. So I say use your words in a more emotional emotionally intimate way and really express how you feel about this person, um, what you think about this person, what you want to hear from this person, how you understand them well, etc. And sort of ramping up the emotional amplitude of your words really creates more of a feeling of connectedness and intimacy. And, and that is very helpful in terms of loneliness. So I, I really say to people, reach out to people that you haven't even talked to for a while or think about. Believe me, they will welcome it. Uh -huh. Richard, uh, Tamara asks, I have lived outside the U.S. for 16 years. I moved back in December of 2019 and started working December 30th. Do I qualify for a check? Yes, is the short answer. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to like the rest of my answer. Uh -oh. It depends on whether or not you have paid taxes and whether or not you are on the government's list, on the IRS's list. If they have your details and you have dutifully paid taxes over those 16 years or filed a US tax return, as you're obliged to do under worldwide taxation by the IRS, then yes, expats are entitled to, as the best that we can tell, judging by previous stimulus checks occasions. One thing to note, just to finish on this, if I may, Frederica, mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk about people not getting their stimulus check until August or September. This is because of the way the checks are being distributed. Mm. Most people will get it via direct deposit into their bank account if the IRS has those details because that's the way they paid their 18 taxes or 19 taxes. But the rest of them, it's just a process of the checks being sent out. All right, we'll leave it there. Richard Quest, Dr. Daria Long, Dr. Gail Saltz, thank you so much to all of you for answering so many questions, and thank you to everybody out there for sending your questions. Really appreciate it.